In this video, we talk about learning outcome number two from lesson 5.2, which is all about the 5% guideline for cumbersome calculations. We've actually talked about this before. We're just talking about it in a new context. Um, after we revisit that 5% guideline, we're going to determine whether it applies um, to a particular procedure. Now, remember what that 5% guideline does for us. It answers this question. We might want to know, when can we treat dependent events as if they're independent? Whenever you have dependent events, the probability of one event depends on the probability of the events that came before it or the outcomes that came before it. And that's going to make that next calculation, that second calculation, um, more um, complex um, than the first calculation. And if you've got an, another event after that that's dependent on one of the first two, that will change that next um, probability calculation as well. So it can be cumbersome if you have dependent events. So we're trying to get around that. We're trying to get around the, that uh, little detail um, in um, calculating those probabilities when the events are dependent by saying, are there some circumstances when we can act as if they're independent, when the values that we get will um, work just fine, they'll be good enough for us. Um, even if we treat the events as if they're independent when they're not, well, there are some circumstances when we can do that. So here are the circumstances. When we're sampling without replacement. So you have some larger population and you are pulling items from that larger population, that's sampling. If you're not putting them back in before you sample again, that's sampling without replacement. Um, and every time you do that, you are changing or you're often changing probabilities. So typically, if you're sampling without replacement, the corresponding events are dependent. So we're sampling without replacement. So technically, these events are dependent. When we're doing that with a sample size n that is no more than 5% of the population size, capital N, or in other words, that sample size is less than or equal to 5% of the size of the population. If that's true, then we can treat the selections as if they're independent, even though they're actually not. And that makes the calculations much simpler for us. Um, and being able to treat them as independent means that it's possible that that procedure um, could be classified or, or estimated by, or the probabilities associated with that procedure could be estimated by um, those given by a binomial probability distribution. So um, that's why we're bringing this in um, or bringing this up again here because we are interested in meeting those requirements for binomial probability distributions in order to compute some probabilities as well as means and standard deviations as we'll talk about later. Okay. Um, just quickly, the rule says if we're sampling without replacement, so you're not putting them back in, and the sample size n is less than or equal to 5% of the total population size, then you can act as if the selections are independent even though they're not. And that's going to make your calculations much simpler. So here's an example. Found this image online of people looking at their phones. I thought it was perfect for this example. The problem statement says, in a survey sponsored by TGI Fridays, 1,000 different adult respondents were randomly selected without replacement. So they were selected and then they were not put back in before others were selected. Each of those respondents was asked if they investigate potential dates on social media. The responses consisted of a yes or a no. They said, yes, I investigate potential dates on social media or no, I never investigate potential dates on social media. The question is, given that the population N is the number of adults in the US who date, apply the 5% guideline for cumbersome calculations to determine whether the trials may be treated as independent. So we're selecting without replacement. So in general, we would think that each of those trials must be dependent because we're selecting without replacement. But now we want to know, can we ignore that? Can we treat them as if they're independent? Um, we'll be able to find that out using that 5% rule. And the second part of the question says, if the trials may be treated as independent, does the procedure yield a binomial probability distribution? 
So let's answer the first part first. Well, our sample size is um, 1000, lowercase n, um, which represents the sample size or the number of trials when you're talking about a binomial uh, probability distribution. Um, that's equal to 1000. The question is, how does that 1000 compare to that um, population size n, where n is the number of adults in the US who are dating? Well, let's figure out what n would have to be in order for this 1000 to be less than or equal to 5% of n. In order to do that, we're going to do a little bit of algebra. So we'll say if n is less than or equal to 5% of capital N, we have this. So 1000 is less than or equal to 5% of n, which is 0 0.05, that 5% 5 in decimal form times n. And if I'm trying to get capital N by itself, I just divide both sides by 0 0.05. And we have 20,000. So if the population size, that's the number of adults in the United States to date, if that number of adults in the United States to date is greater than or equal to 20,000 adults, then it's fine. We can treat the events as if they're independent, even though they're actually dependent. Because we're selecting without replacement and that's why they're technically dependent. Okay, now let's answer the second part of the question. The question says, if the trials may be treated as independent, does the procedure yield a binomial probability distribution? Now, I guess we never really answered the question over here. We said, provided that there are more than 20,000 dating adults in the population, the 5% guideline applies. Um, and I think, I think we all know that there are more than 20,000 people in this country who are um, dating right now. So yes, the 5% guideline applies and we can treat the events as though they're independent even though they're technically dependent. Okay, now let's answer the second part of the question. It says, if the trials may be treated as independent, and they may, um, does the procedure yield a binomial probability distribution? Well, in order to figure that out, we need to check our four conditions. So do we have a fixed number of trials? Yes, we have 1,000 trials. We have 1,000 survey respondents. Are they independent? Well, no, not technically but we can treat them as if they're independent due to the 5% guideline. So we're going to use that binomial probability distribution here, um, provided that the other um, requirements for binomial probability distributions hold. Um, now we shouldn't technically do that um, because our probabilities will be slightly inaccurate due to the fact that the trials are dependent rather than independent, but we're saying, it's close enough since the 5% guideline applies. So we can approximate our probabilities um, using the binomial probability distribution because the 5% guideline applies. So we don't have independent trials, but we can pretend that we do. And then the third requirement was asking this question, does each trial have exactly two outcomes? Well, yeah, we asked the survey responses, do you look up potential uh, dates on social media? Yes or no? So one of those would be considered success and the other one would be considered failure. So there are exactly two outcomes. So that's what makes it a binomial probability distribution. Binomial, that uh, BI stands for two. And then the last part of the question or the last requirement is that the probability of success remains the same in all trials. Say, well, yeah, I guess we can assume that those being surveyed have an equal probability of saying yes or no. That one is the, the one on this list that I'm not 100% sure about. But all other things being equal, I guess we can make that assumption and then keep our, that assumption in mind. So given that we've made that assumption and that we're treating dependent events as if they're independent because of the 5% rule, we can use the binomial probability distribution um, to describe probabilities of X number of successes in those 1000 trials. Now here is the third part of the question. Um, I, it said, the original question said part A and part B and I just added this part C here at the end. Part C says, well, what if the population were changed? 
instead of looking at the total number of people in the US who are dating, what if we change the population to the student body at Tulsa Community College? Well, at Tulsa Community College, there are approximately 16,500 students according to this website. Well, in that case, if I were to look at the sample size and take it as, um, or find out what percent that sample size is of the uh, total population, I'd be taking that 1,000 and dividing by that 16,500 and then multiplying by 100% to get a percentage. When we do that, we get six, approximately 6.06%. Uh, 6 um, that's more than 5%. So in this case, if our population is the student body at TCC, rather than the population or rather than the population of all um, adults in the US who are interested in dating, then the 5% guideline is not met and the events should be treated as dependent rather than independent. Because of how this N, this lowercase N, that sample size compares to that total population.